everyone. So today we are talking about Unit 7, but it's part of Unit 7 that really hits uh, topics from different um, units. So we'll largely be covering topics 1.5, 6.1, 6.6, and 6.7. So what we're really looking at today is why do we industrialize where we do? Uh, and this is, again, still all about industrial and economic development patterns and processes. So a tidbit of the day is that in the early 1860s, an estimated 20% of Britain's textile workers were under 15 years old. So that means that 20%, one in five people working in the textile industry was probably your age or younger. Uh, the Factory Act of 1833 stipulated that children under age eight couldn't work in factories at all. Um, children ages 9 to 13 could work no more than 9 hours per day uh, and 13 to 18 could work no more than 12 hours per day. So remember this is industrial revolution era. There were 9 to 13 year olds who worked more hours in a day than probably your parents do and 13 to 18 were working literally half the day probably every day of the week because we did not have the mandatory two-day weekends we maybe had sundays off because sunday was because sunday was the sabbath it was the day that you go to church the day of rest so we have a lot of learning objectives and a lot of essential knowledge here, but realistically, we've already covered all of this stuff. So this is really just kind of um, re, it's, it's integrating all of the things that we've already learned uh, into this new unit and kind of seeing how they all fit together. All right, so we wanna be able to explain how major geographic concepts illustrate spatial relationships, explain the processes that initiate and drive urbanization and suburbanization, explain how low, medium, and high density housing characteristics represent different patterns of residential use and also industrial use, um, and explain how a city's infrastructure relates to local politics, society, and the environment. Remember, all of these things are related to industry and why things are where they are. And then our essential knowledge is that concepts of nature and society include sustainability, natural resources, and land use. Site and situation influence the origin, function, and growth of cities, changes in transportation and communication, population growth, migration, economic development, and government policies influence urbanization. Residential building and patterns of land use reflect the shape of the, uh, reflect and shape the city's culture, technological capabilities, and cycles of development and infilling. And the location and quality of the city's infrastructure directly affects its spatial patterns of economic and social development. And again, I know that's a lot, but we've already talked about a lot of this stuff. This is really just seeing how it fits now that we're talking about industrialization. All right, so first things first, we wanna look at the definition for site. And we have up here a Freyer model, and you may or may not have used these before, uh, but they're a really great vocab tool. So looking at site, our word in the middle, we first wanna know the definition. So the definition of site is the physical characteristics of a place. The characteristics of site, the actual physical attributes. So for example, is it hilly? Is it flat? Is it on a river? Um, what is the climate like, any of those things, the actual physical attributes. Examples of sites, so for Seattle, Washington, it's located on the Puget Sound and it has a rainy season. And non-example, so a non-example, most, uh, a non-example preferably will be things that are really similar to, to the the term but not quite there we want to make sure that we're differentiating so like obviously something like mustard would be a non-example of site but that's not useful to us we want to use non-examples that are actually useful so again examples look over here so non-examples would be that it would be north of olympia or near tacoma or a couple hours south of canada those are similar to site but they're not actually what site is because they're not talking about the actual physical attributes all right, and again, those were for Seattle. So situation, because site and situation are really important with what we're talking about today. This is the why things are where they are. Definition of situation. It is the location of a place relative to other places. Characteristics, it uses other places to describe location and the most in, it is the most important factor on growth potential. 
So for example, Seattle, Washington is located about 20 miles north of Tacoma and is located near Issaquah. Non-examples be that it would have four seasons, has a temperate climate, it's hilly. So I want you to notice that the non-examples here are site examples and that the non-examples here are situation examples. Okay, so we're gonna look at industrial site and situation factors. And this video is actually gonna be two parts. Um, this first part will probably be a little bit longer, but we're gonna try to move through it pretty quickly. And then we'll split it into the second part in the next video. So situation factors include a few things. First one is cost of transportation. Uh, so how much does it cost to transport inputs versus the finished goods uh, as determined by weight or is determined by weight? So how much it costs to move something, where is it heaviest? The heavier something is, the more expensive it is to transport because you can't transport as much of it. Uh, shipping transportation is limited by weight. So what we're really looking at here is, is the industry bulk reducing or bulk gaining? And we're gonna talk about what those terms mean. Those determine where we put the factory. So do we put it close to inputs or do we put it close to the market? The site factors are labor, capital, and land characteristics. These are more important than situation for some industries, but not for all of them. And one of the things that we really look at with these site factors is something called Weber's least cost theory. So Weber's least cost theory predicts that the location of a manufacturing site uh, relative to the location of the resources and the market. And there are key variables here. So transportation costs, labor costs, and agglomeration. And that's basically how connected industries are. You'd like to put things near each other that are related to each other so that they can benefit each other. And the energy use, uh, energy used to be critical, um, but modern electricity has really lessened that. So we rely on stuff uh, on this modern electricity and that allows us to get our energy in more efficient ways. So we don't have to worry so much about being really close to energy sources anymore. So an agglomeration is a clustering of similar businesses to share the costs and access to the needed services and transportation. This makes it cheaper. The more that businesses can share costs, the more access they have to the same resources or to mutually needed resources, the better off this can be. So for example, Silicon Valley in California, we have stuff like the Google campus, um, the Apple campus, the uh, Hewlett Packard campus, IBM, all of these things, and they are near each other because they are related. So if you have processors that need to go in those computers, it's gonna be cheapest to have them next to each other or to develop them next to each other so that they can work in conjunction rather than having these long, far away distances to communicate with each other or to ship things, um, have to ship it way from way far away to a place and then somewhere else and all that other stuff. So it's beneficial to have them close together so that they can work together really easily. And also in least cost theory, producers should minimize transportation and labor costs and maximize agglomeration. So really all the st same stuff that we're saying, just in a more condensed form. And this is what it looks like. So this is a model, and I know it's not a very good picture, um, but we imagine a triangle because we have one input, we have another input, and then we have the market. And that looks the same either way but it's gonna look different depending on if we're talking about bulk gaining or bulk reducing industries. A bulk reducing industry would mean that the inputs weigh more than the final product. For example, steel. When we have the inputs of steel, we're talking carbon and iron. We have to mine those things. So the raw product is going to weigh more than it will after we refine it and put it together to make the steel. So yeah, in the end, steel is really heavy, but the products that go into making steel are actually heavier when combined when raw. So 
what we would want to do in this case is to put the industry, the industrial location where we're actually making the steel, really close to the inputs. And it can be a lot farther from the market because it's going to be che cheaper to ship once the final product is created. On the other hand, a bulk gaining industry is one where the inputs weigh less than the final product. So for example, auto assembly. The, all of the inputs that go into making cars, each of those individually is gonna weigh way less than that final car product. The tires, the all of the parts that go into the engine, the doors, the frame, all of those things. And yeah, again, they're heavy, but the final product, that finished car, is going to weigh way more than all the inputs do. So <coughs> in this case, it can be much farther from the inputs because we want that shipping cost to be minimized. So we put it really close to the market. And this is still largely true. We will ship a little bit farther, but for the most part, cars are made fairly near where they're sold because they're really heavy. You can't ship a whole, and they're really big. You can't ship a whole lot of them at a time. Okay, again, so we're looking at the locational triangle. We're looking at the model for Weber's least cost theory. So if one input is more bulk reducing than the other, the factory will be pulled toward it. Um, and it's going to be pulled toward the market if it's bulk gaining. So for example, here we're talking about material A. Material A is gold. Material B is silver uh, and our mileage, right? So where do we want to put things. Um, if the material is heavy, if it's costly to transport, we're going to put it the least transportation cost point. We're going to put the industrial location closer to the heavier material, closer to the heavier input. This one we still want it to be close to the closer to the inputs, but this is going to be a lot lighter. So silver in this case, we can make it a lot farther from there. So it's going to be closest to gold um, and fairly equidistant from the second input to the market. So this is going to be the costliest and shortest to transport, second costliest and second shortest to transport, and then finally the finished product is going to be the cheapest and the longest to transport. It's going to take us a lot longer to move these things because it's a lot cheaper to ship once it's a final product. Okay, so bulk reducing industry, and we already briefly went over this, but we're going to go over it again. The definition, so product where the, or production where the inputs weigh more than the final product. Again, we are reducing the bulk. Characteristics, we would place it near the source of the inputs to reduce transportation costs because heavy stuff is expensive to ship. Uh, for example, steel, paper, and canning foods. Uh, paper, remember, this is coming from trees. So the trees themselves actually are really heavy, as you know, not actually, but they're really heavy, as you hopefully know. So the final product, even though paper, a whole lot of it weighs a lot, it's a lot lighter than trying to ship the entire tree somewhere. So we're going to make that industry really, really close to sawmills, to where they're cutting down the lumber. I actually grew up in a community like this and we had a lot of forest around us. They, they felled lumber a lot and then they shipped it to the paper mill. <coughs> canning foods also are a bulk reducing industry. Uh, so if you think about the stuff that gets canned, whether we're talking like uh, vegetables or fruits or meats, that first product is going to be pretty heavy, relatively speaking, because you get rid of some of it when you can it. For example, if you can tuna, you get rid of a lot of the fish before you ever can the actual tuna. Same thing if you're canning a green beans. Green beans don't weigh a whole lot, but you get rid of a lot of it before you can them. And then you put everything together, ship out the final product. Non-examples of bulk reducing industry in like site and situation, these are things that are sort of similar, but not the same. Beverage distribution and car manufacture. All right, so location close to the inputs, copper. 
Copper in most mining is what we would consider bulk reducing. So the inputs weigh more than the final product. Um, so we locate smelters, and that is a real term, uh, where we refine the mined material, refined, uh, where we refine the ore. Uh, near the mines to increase the value per weight by removing the non-copper rock from the ore. We get rid of everything that's not what we actually want. And that's why it's bulk reducing. We get rid of the bulk and keep that final product. So the industrial factories are near the heavy inputs to reduce transportation costs. Once you get rid of all the rocks and stuff, you are shipping more stuff that's worth more. Okay, so same concept that we looked at before. And again, if one input is more bulk reducing than the other, then the factory is going to be pulled toward it. And it's pulled toward the market if bulk gaining. So here we're looking at a map that is showing where mineral resources are distributed across the planet. Um, take a moment, pause here, and kind of get an idea of the things that we look for. So ferrous metals are essentially magnetic things. They have iron uh, in them to some extent. Uh, we have non-ferrous metals, so things that magnets won't stick to. We have non-metallic minerals, things like diamonds, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And then we look at the percent of total world production. And the ferrous, uh, sorry, iron, um, bosite, and diamonds are 15% and above of the world production. Um, if they're capitalized, sorry, that's a, the, kind of the wrong thing. If they're lowercase, they are 15, or sorry, 5 to 14 percent. And then the anything yellow is a major mineral producer. So check out where those are on this map. Take a few minutes to look at this. Pause it here. Um, some important minerals for industry are dispersed throughout the entire world, um, throughout the Earth's crust. So with site, if the resources are heavy, we are putting the site next to the resources to reduce the weight with refinement. Really, it's just the same thing that we said before. We get rid of the bulk that we don't need, the stuff we don't want, before we ever ship it very far. Okay, so with copper, we have a concentration and smelting plants. Uh, the concentration and smelting plants are located near the mines. So everything is going to be close together. And you can see here on this map where the mines are or sorry the foundries are located so the higher number the darker the color again this is a choropleth map we've looked at this before um, and what we see is that there are a lot down here in um, Arizona in Utah then in New Mexico and then we have Nevada and Montana as well uh, so two-thirds of the US copper is mined in Arizona and again look at this proportional symbol part of the map, the bigger or smaller circles, um, to tell you how much the mine has, what their capacity is in thousands of metric tons, so quite a lot of copper. Um, manufacturing in foundries is not bulk reducing, they are bulk gaining, so they are located near the markets to reduce transportation costs. There are parts of copper that are bulk reducing and parts of copper that are bulk gaining. Okay, so a bulk gaining industry. This is where the products gain weight or bulk during the production. And characteristics, the product is heavy, so it is close to the markets to, pr to reduce transportation costs. Um, for example, motor vehicles, single market manufacturers, so things where they're literally only making like stuff for one market, um, zippers, auto parts, they're selling to particular places, and it's near the limited customers because that's going to be the most cost efficient way to ship it. Also perishables like um, bakeries and dairy stuff that will spoil really quickly, we consider it to be bulk gaining and it's going to be very near the market. Think back to uh, the Von Thunen model, stuff that perishes quickly we want close by so that we are reducing the costs as much as possible. Non-examples are going to be ore smelting, agriculture, especially grains because they last for a very long time and ship really well, um, and things like paper and lumber. All right, so looking at beverage production in bulk gaining. Um, soda and beer production are bulk gaining, basically anything that we're drinking, um, because of the addition of liquid. Liquid is really, really heavy. If you pick up a gallon of water or a gallon of milk, it weighs approximately eight pounds. For one gallon, not too much, but 
remember how many gallons get shipped at a time because that's the most effective and efficient way to do it. So bottling is going to take place near large population clusters. Um, it, you probably have a beverage distribution company like a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi-Cola near you. And if you have one of them, you probably have the other one. Um, it might not be right in your town if you live in a small town, but you'll have one near a pretty large population cluster near you um, because it's way more efficient to actually just put the water in at that beverage distribution company. They'll ship everything else uh, to the distribution place, but once they get it there, that's where they actually add the water so that you can, they can ship it more uh, cost effectively. So here we're looking at, um, again, a choropleth map, but showing us where the population, uh, the persons per square kilometer are. So we are looking here at the arithmetic density. Where are people located? And then we are looking at who, which companies are where. So in this case, it happens to be beer. Um, and we're looking at Anheuser-Busch or Miller Coors. So purple is Anheuser-Busch, blue is Miller Coors, and where those are located. And notice that they are located near the highest population centers. Okay. So looking here, um, and I forgot to change the top of this, this is vehicles, it's auto manufacturer, not beverage production, but still bulk gaining. So vehicles are mostly produced in areas where they're sold because they are bulk gaining. Um, where are they producing the most? Again, core pleth map, darkest colors above 10 million, then one to 10, below 1 million or no production. And check out where those are. So where we drive the most cars, where we have huge numbers of people driving, we have the greatest motor vehicle production. We know that India has the second highest population in the world, significantly higher than the United States, but also significantly fewer people in India actually drive or drive a car. Um, in Southeast Asia in particular, they tend to drive a lot more motorbikes, so motorcycles or scooters, um, small uh, engine vehicles, two-wheel vehicles, because they're cheaper they're more efficient and you can fit a lot more of them on the road, which is great when it's crowded. All right, so car manufacturers are less likely to be local um, than say like the beverage production, but eight car makers account for 70% of car sales worldwide. And they have assembly plants in all three major industrial regions. So we are looking at World motor vehicle sales in 2014, so millions of vehicles. China got 20, had 23.5 million vehicles sold. Uh, North America had, including Mexico, had 19.9 million. Everywhere else in Asia basically had 19.1, Europe had 15.9, and the rest of the world had 9.8 combined. And so again, looking at where they're produced versus where they're sold. All right, so let's look at these changing situation factors and looking at steel. So we talked about that a little bit. There are two main inputs, iron and coal or iron and carbon, and US steel mills have changed location based on the changing source of raw materials. So it used to be really near the inputs, but that's changed over time. Um, we now have mini mills, they're much smaller, and they're now based in proximity to sources of recycled and scrap metal. So they're closer to markets and closer to the sources of the inputs. It used to be in places like Pittsburgh. Um, that's why it's the steel city. That's why the Pittsburgh Steelers are a football team because that's where they made steel. It was near um, the Great Lakes. They could get it out onto the lakes and out onto the ocean and ship it in the, to the rest of uh, the world. But it was also located near where they were mining the iron and the coal in places like West Virginia in the Appalachian Mountains. But today we're not mining as much. We're largely recycling our metal. It's much cheaper. Um, and fortunately, it's also a little bit more environmentally friendly in that we're not destroying the planet to mine. So most steel production has shifted to developing countries, especially China. The United States still produces quite a lot of steel, but China produces the most steel in the world. And shifting steel production reflects the shifting global industrial distribution, basically saying, where do we have the most industrial stuff happening? Where are, where are the 
um, factories and things located, that's where we have the steel production. So historically, steel mills were located to minimize transportation costs of raw materials and utilize waterways for transportation. So in the United States, they were typically located near the Great Lakes, and that's what I was telling you before. So over here is Pittsburgh. Um, here we are in Ohio and all the various places in Michigan, in Indiana, and Illinois. Uh, the brown here, all of this is where we are finding or mining the coal. The purple is where we're getting the iron ore. And this is what I was talking about with Appalachia. Um, and then we have the historic centers. So where they used to do it. And make sure you pause to read over these. These are really, really important. Um, and the integrated mills. Okay, And we can see largely the mills are located near the Great Lakes because then they can pop uh, up and go out to the Atlantic Ocean. So how they've changed. Um, the steel mini mills are located closer to the markets, which also serve as sources of recycled and scrap metal. Where you're selling the steel is more likely where you're going to find this, the recycled steel. So you can see that these things have changed a lot over time. And here we're talking about what are they actually building um, or making. So we see different things made in different areas, um, but we do still see a big, uh, variance, a uh, dispersed distribution of all of the different places. But also notice that they're still typically, not always, but typically in places where land is going to be cheaper. So in the south, this is one of our major industrial regions still. Some in the midwest, some in the central um, east, up here still where it's fairly inexpensive. Uh, in upstate New York, in uh, over in the west a bit in some of our densely populated but often slightly less costly areas except for when we get up here into like Seattle and here in um, California but lots of workers okay so beginning in the 1980s steel moved from almost exclusively MDCs to mostly LDCs and we want to know why Okay. So by 2013, access to growing primary inputs and increasing demand of growing industries like the automobile industry, think of how many were in that map before in 2014, pushed 73% of steel production to LDCs. NICs, or newly industrialized countries, have very, very high demand for steel as they develop because they want to build more stuff. So to build the one of the best things that you can use is steel. It's really strong, um, really sturdy, lasts for a long time. So take a moment and eyeball here where steel is being produced. Um, and these are the, our percentages and our locations. Again, a choropleth map. So it used to be the United States was the major producer. Today it is China and also Japan, interestingly. So let's look at US truck freight corridors. And corridor essentially just means a place where it's happening. So truck freight movements are concentrated in the Eastern United States, and we wanna know why. And really what they mean by truck freight is like semis, tractor trailers. Um, how are they transporting all of these bulk goods? And that's really what they mean by freight. So here we are looking at the major routes we're looking at the daily truck volume. So the big thick lines are 8,500 and above. The thinner or uh, lighter colored lines are below 8,500. The annual truck transits, how many go through there? Big red uh, symbol is 1 million and above. Uh, yellow is below a million. So check out these major locations. Laredo is kind of interesting because it's so far to the south. Right on the border with Mexico, we have a lot of freight coming in. Um, and to Mexico, but also Houston, Baton Rouge, Savannah, Charleston, Norfolk, uh, New York, um, Buffalo, Detroit, Port, Port Huron. These ones largely because they're again located on the Great Lakes, Chicago, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and then a whole bunch of other cities that are exceptionally important, but not quite as many as um, these other places that I mentioned. So that why. There's less distance between population centers now. Um, 
Western cities are more spread out due to being founded in the industrialized age with or the industrial age with better transportation. Here, everything was close to get together because A, that's where everybody lived, so they typically make things close together, but also largely because their transportation was terrible. When you have to rely on walking or a horse to get you to places, neither of those things is going to get you very far. Um, with any reasonable distance. You're not going to walk eight days to go somewhere for the most part. So cities tended to be closer. But once we get out west, this happens way later and it happens during the industrial era. Era We now have trains. We're eventually going to have trucks um, and we can transport things way farther so cities can be farther apart and population centers can be farther apart. All right, so looking at train freight. So we looked at truck freight, now we're looking at train freight. And again, the thickness of these lines is going to say how many millions of metric tons are being uh, transported along these routes. And then our proportional symbols, how many millions of tons are going through those ports. Okay. So most rail freight movements are between the east and the west. And we wanna think about why. So take a moment to think about that. So longer distances that require um, more than a day, that's why they're going east to west, because this is going to be fairly expensive. It's not as efficient necessarily as, as transporting things on a truck. So the north-south distances are much shorter and trucks can handle those really easily. So the far distances you want to put on a train because they're just going and going and going. They don't have to make all of the stops like a truck makes typically. And then those north-south uh, routes are largely covered by trucks. All right, so world shipping routes. Shipping occurs between North America, Europe, and the industrial centers in Asia. One large cost-efficient cargo ship um, whole, uh, holds a whole bunch of containers. Sorry, that was weirdly worded and I goofed on that. Um, think about the container ships. Those containers are an absolutely immense and incredible innovation. And I know that sounds silly and really boring, but it's awesome. Uh, so we, there is this guy who developed these containers and they were perfectly situated to be able to stack on top of each other so they could go on a ship and there's no wasted space. You fill them full, they're really um, sturdy and you just stack them on the container ships. And then once you get them to the port and you start, uh, you have a uh, break of bulk point. So literally you are breaking down the bulk of the shipping. They take the cranes, which can grab those containers and basically they can stack them and they can stay there for a long period of time. Um, or they can directly set them on a truck and there's no moving there's no having to break down the containers and put them in something else to fit them and ship them. They just take the container off the ship or out of the storage area and can set it right on top of the truck and ship it. And it's so much more cost effective than the old school way of doing it where you literally had to break down all of the bulk and then pile it onto something new. Think about if you've ever watched old movies where they were breaking down stuff like bananas um, and you'd have to take them out of all of the off those ships and all of the old stuff and put them in something new to ship them out. Now they just do it all in one. All right, so let's look at the major areas. So the port cargo volume by million tons, red is 200 million tons and above, yellow is 100 to 199 million. We have really significant areas. Check over here in China. Um, the transportation is absolutely immense and largely that stuff coming out of China, but not exclusively. And then our shipping routes, the big thick lines um, are going to be the highest numbers, the thinner lines are lower. And I want you to notice these red circles too, because these are really important. These are choke points. Where can things get bunched up? Uh, this one here in the Suez Canal is pretty important uh, because that just was on the news with the ship that got stuck and basically blocked world shipping for six days. Uh, because going around here is incredibly dangerous. It's incredibly time uh, time consuming. Um, takes way longer than going through here and is uh, really expensive. So all of those things add up. 
Panama Canal, very thin, very narrow, Straits of Gibraltar, uh, through Singapore. We just have all these different uh, choke points where things can essentially get held up and can cause some serious, serious issues if that happens. So in summary, and I know this was a longer one, the next one's gonna be shorter. Um, the concepts of nature and society include sustainability, natural resources, and land use. And I want you specifically to think about factory locations as related to this. Site and situation influence the origin, function, and growth of cities, including the factories. Remember that our earliest cities um, and even some of, many of our later cities are popping up around industrial centers. So changes in production and communication, uh, population growth, migration, economic development, and government policies influence industrialization. And that is it for today. So go back and review anything. This was a hefty video. Make sure that you have all of the information. Pause it where you need to pause it. Let me know if you have any questions. Make sure you're doing your reading. Make sure you're working on your critical thinking and your review. And have a great day.